Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Better Events Podcast. This is Mary Davidson, one of your co-hosts. And in today's episode, we are talking all about why it's important and how you can keep learning. This is a really interesting episode, and we are joined by a friend of the pod, a returning guest, Jacqueline. And Jacqueline and Logan have a wonderful conversation about the importance of why we need to keep learning as event professionals and resources that they recommend. So let's get into it. Welcome to the Better Events Podcast. Join two event strategists, Logan Clements and Mary Davidson, who believe we can all create, host, and attend better events. In this podcast, you will learn about event strategy and actions that you can use today as an event host, planner, or manager. Hear directly from the people who are creating innovative and inspiring events today and tomorrow, and grow your business along the way. Now, let's get started, and thanks for listening to the Better Events Podcast. Welcome back, friends, to another episode of the Better Events Podcast. I'm your co-host, Logan Clements, and this week we have something special for you. I am joined by a guest co-host because Mary is a busy away working an event this week, but I was very fortunate to have my friend of the pod, and you might remember her from episode three of the Better Events Podcast, Jacqueline Sobel. Welcome, Jacqueline. Hi, thanks for having me. So excited to be here. Yeah. Can you remind our listeners, just give us like the quick, like short summary of, of who you are, what you do. So I'm Jacqueline. I am an event producer, uh, jack of all trades, no pun intended to my name. Um, I specialize in all types of events, uh, corporate, experiential, et cetera, um, and just make it all happen and have fun doing it. Amazing. Well, before we jump into this week's topic, which is all about how we can can keep learning as event professionals, we're going to do a quick little conversation starter. And uh, Jacqueline, I got to know, and I'm sure our listeners are dying to know, uh, what is your favorite kitchen utensil? My favorite kitchen utensil is an oven mitt. It's been that way since I was a teenager. I have no good reason why. I just find them lots of fun. What is yours, Logan? (laughs) I love this conversation started listeners. This was Jacqueline's idea. This is, it, it tickles me. Sorry. Um, my favorite kitchen utensil. I feel like it has to be the spatula. I feel like I just use it for everything that I'm not a big cook. Those who know me know that I love to eat, but I'm not a big cook, but honestly, I probably have like four spatulas because I use them all the time, making eggs, doing all kinds of stuff. It's very versatile. It's important. And for the record, I have one oven mitt that I use all the time because I love it. I don't oh, have a, very cute. a plethora of <laughs> when this episode comes out, Jacqueline, we might need you to send us a picture of your uh, oven mitt so we can put it on our stories. But right, right. Um, <laughs> going beyond the kitchen utensils, listeners, uh, why we chose this topic of how to keep learning as an event pro. Um, Jacqueline, and I have known each other for a number of years. And Mary, I know also feels really strongly about this. This podcast is kind of one of the ways that we like to show that we're constantly learning as event pros. But I think it's something that with events, we all it, the events are constantly changing. If anything, the event industry is, we've all had to learn in the last three years, if not before then. Um, and so we just thought it'd be really important to have this discussion. I uh, wanted to bring Jacqueline in specifically, because I think she's got a really fun perspective on this. And we're going to just be talking about why it's important, some examples of learning opportunities, some resources we might use, and we might touch on some examples of bad learning opportunities. We'll see listeners, you'll have to stick around. Um, but without further ado, let's let's jump into it, Jacqueline. So I'll let you go first, but why is it important, important that we keep learning as event pros? I think it's important to keep learning in general, in life, um, as a human, uh, but especially in whatever industry you're in, in this case, we're talking about events. Um, the industry is constantly changing, technology is constantly changing, the clients are constantly changing, um, the, you know, the, the demographics are constantly changing. So you want to keep up with uh, what is happening in the industry. And specifically, you know, there's so many types of events. So specifically within your genre of event type, whether it's I do mostly, um, you know, corporate and experiential, um, but I know people also do social. So it de- it depends on people also do um, fundraisers and such. So it depends on whatever your genre is, but you should absolutely always keep learning and want to keep learning. You know, I've learned um, from uh, older people than me. I've learned from younger people than me. I've learned from people the same age as me, um, but I enjoy learning from the 360 uh, point of view. I feel like I I couldn't agree more, Jacqueline. I think uh, there is a special part of, maybe if you work in a different industry, you'll disagree with me, but I really think you have to have a love of learning to work in events. 
because if you were a stick in the mud of wanting to do it the same way that you were doing it when you first started doing events, no matter if that was last year or 30 years ago, you, you probably are going to get left behind eventually. So you kind of have to have this love of learning, especially if you want to have a longevity in the industry, because things that we did 30 years ago are, you know, taboo or just even like look down upon than what we do them today. Um, just let alone like the one niche of like event technology, the things that were really, you know, cutting edge back in 2000 are no longer cutting edge in 2022. Even the things that were cutting edge in 2020 are no longer cutting edge in 2022. So Very I just true. think it's so important. And I think I agree with you, Jacqueline, of just also being open to like that knowledge and, you know, where you can learn can come in so many different forms and come from so many different people. And don't think it's just the older, more experienced folks can help you learn, but also looking down at the people behind you or with less experience than you that still might have that fresh set of eyes um, or new perspective or just be have their finger on the pulse like social media. I mean, I remember I had to go to YouTube to look up how to do a TikTok dance back in 2019. Uh, and luckily there were some social media <laughs> interns and I was like, wow, I just feel old saying that just being like, I had to go to YouTube to understand this other newfangled, you know, platform. And now it's something that I, I am on and, and probably check more often than just like I do Instagram. So, um, you know, even I had to learn, but, um, yeah, you'll never find me on TikTok probably. I'll look at a video if you send it to me, but I, I, I feel like I'm too old for it, but, um, but that's also part of it is knowing what what you don't know, right? There's plenty, like, I love to impart my knowledge on, on the younger generation, um, up and comers. I love to, like I said before, I love to learn from them too, but I also know what I don't know. And I'm okay not knowing certain things and asking about it. Again, whether it's someone who's my peer around my age, if it's someone older, someone younger, you know, always looking for that information um, and leaving that communication open with the team that you're working with. Um, or someone maybe you're just meeting for a cup of coffee that you, you know, met at a networking event and you just kind of want to bounce ideas off of, you know, just being okay with not knowing something and wanting to learn from that. Yeah. And I think uh, when we say learning, I feel like most people often think of like degrees, you know, going to college for it, school, or maybe specific certifications. But Jacqueline, I want to get your thoughts. Like, what do you think? Do you, one, do you have a, a degree in events and or any of the certifications? And like, where do you see the value in them? What's your reaction to them? Um, I've taken a couple like um, certification, basic certification courses, but over the years, they weren't, at least when I started out, I don't think they're as prominent as they are now, or they weren't as prominent then as they are now. Um, so I don't have like a CMP, although I have all the actual knowledge. Um, I just haven't like taken the official course. Um, I, I totally see the value for the younger people coming up if they want to learn. I know that there's other courses out there for very specific you know, niche things, you know, whether it's like virtual producing or whatever. Um, I don't discount them. I think um, because you have to have a baseline knowledge, but I also think hands on um, is very important. I, I would rather um, learn by experience, shadow somebody or bring someone in to shadow me um, to to learn. But again, I, I, I don't discount those at all. I think they can be helpful for some people. For me, I feel like I've kind of been in the industry too long to to go back and uh, get all those certifications because I feel like I, I don't maybe maybe I'll go teach them one day. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat with you, Jacqueline. I don't have a degree in events. Um, I don't really have it. I don't have a CMP or some of those certifications. Um, but I, I will say I agree with you that I think there's value in them. But I think a theme that's going to come out of this episode that you'll hear listeners is how important hands-on experience is and how you really can't replace that of actually having done events. And we've talked about in past episodes about how if you're just getting started and, you know, you kind of need the gig to get the experience, but you need the experience to get the gig, well, you need to start doing gigs. And if that's volunteering, again, as you get busier, you don't need to do that as much. But when you're first starting out or uh, I think I talked about this on an, ep an episode, but if not, like I volunteered a month ago and that's now led to three paid events. And, you know, I've been doing this five, six years or six, seven years at this point, um, and I'm still seeing value out of it. So I think those like CMPs and certifications are helpful, but I don't think they're a replacement for the real world experience. Like you definitely need the experience to back it up. 
that being said, I have like a degree, my degrees in Chinese language and literature, and I did events in China. And that was helpful to validate that. Yes, I do know my language skills because it was my major in college. But I, I don't know if I would see that necessarily from the event side. I have spoken to people that have CMPs and the other, those other certifications and some of them too. It's like when you were in like, you know, second grade and you're learning certain parts of math or even in, in high school and some of the like trigonometry, unless you're like a math, uh, mathematician, um, you don't necessarily use it every day. And there are some things on uh, the CMP test too, that, that don't have real world experience. I, again, don't discount them. I think all learning is important. Um, but like, like you said, Logan, I definitely um, think hands-on hands-on experience is is the way to go. And I think volunteering your time um, and chat and or shadowing someone, which I guess is volunteering your time, uh, it, is priceless. And you can learn so much. And like you said, you've gotten lucky, and it, it led to some some opportunities for you, which is great. Um, but uh, but yeah. Yeah. And I think it's not to say that a CMP or something like that in the future wouldn't be the right. I mean, I'm definitely still in the camp. Like I love the idea of an MBA. I don't have one. I want it at some point, but like you, Jacqueline, I'm like oh, the long, I, you know, so busy and continuing to be busy doing the stuff I love. I don't feel like I can take the time to go do that. Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have value or is important um, to be able to do. But I would just, if you are newer to the industry, I would put more emphasis on the actual experience versus getting these certifications because I've only had it ha happen once. And Jacqueline, I'd be interested after that, like what your reaction to this had been. I only had one time where I think I got asked about being a CMP and it was because I was doing subcontracting work for the government and they have certain thresholds of rates that if you had a CMP or an MBA, it had to be a master's degree in a relevant field. Um, it instantly bumped you up. Like it was in lieu of years of experience. So the, the equation there was like, I either had to have 16 years of experience or only six to eight years of experience. But if I had a CMP or a master's, that would bump me up into that rate period. Have you ever had someone asking you for that? Once in a while, I get the question, not, not very often, um, because I usually just go into my experience and, you know, what I can do, what I can do and what I have done. And usually that supersedes uh, the, the rest of it. They kind of go, okay. <laughs> so I, I haven't like lost, lost a gig yet, knock on wood. Uh, I haven't lost a gig yet due, due to not having one, but not a good yeah. you said, thing is not possible. No. And, and well, in this one, for that example, I gave, it wasn't a question of giving me, of me getting the gig or not. It was more just the pay scale. So they were going to be able to offer me a higher rate if I had those certifications. Um, so to me, it was more just intriguing because I was like, oh, there's an actual real world you know, do dollar amount value to some of these degrees that I just haven't seen with my corporate clients or my nonprofits. They're very much more interested in my anecdotes and stories about how I can help them, you know, do their, do the thing based on events I've done in the past versus uh, asking for certifications and things. Um, yeah. And, and just to go back a, a second, as I'm thinking about this, some of the courses or classes I have taken um, in the events world, uh, you know, I'm, I know you know me, Logan. I don't. I know the listeners don't necessarily know me. I definitely have zero ego, um, and I definitely don't think I'm better than anybody, for sure. But and like I said at the beginning, I always want to learn and think I can learn more. Uh, but I've taken these some of these classes, and I'm like, I could teach this, you know. Like I, I like I know this, and again, not discounting for for people starting out or even even someone just wanting to get into the industry, regardless of of age. Um, but, you know, I, I look at these classes sometimes. And I'm like, oh, I can teach this. I, I, I know all these things. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, there was a day, though, with Mary, uh, Jacqueline, we'd have to think back to it of when we were first getting started. Or maybe now you can use examples from what you learn now. But like, what are what is your favorite way to learn right now? Or if you want to reflect back to first when you got into events, how do you like to learn? Well, when I first started, I think if I would have taken some of these classes, if they would have been available to me, I think it would have been helpful just to have a baseline knowledge. But I kind of just learned by doing, you know, I have a whole production background. So I was in TV production before I segued into events, which, you know, there are crossover lines with the live events. You know, I do work on a lot of award shows and such like that. So there is that uh, crossover. Um, but I do have a full full production background. So I had a little bit of inkling of how the event world works, but they are very different. 
um, in, in what I do day to day versus if I'm working on like a TV production or something. Um, but I just like to learn by doing, you know, um, and I, I will get on calls or get on site and I will be that person and I will ask all the questions, not because I want to annoy, annoy anybody, but I want to like legitimately know, right. I, you know, and I want to, I want to learn and I want to have the knowledge, um, and want to see how things are done. Um, and I think that's how anybody who wants to work in events, uh, or even does work in events, if they want to do a different type of event, um, or what have you, you know, just, just go and learn and ask the questions, obviously use your timing and know when to ask, or, you know, or just make a list if, if it's a bad time, you know, we all have our uh, cell phones with us at all times, open up a note and just start making a list of questions that you want to ask when, when things aren't as crazy, if you're on site um, or in the middle of a call and you're just like listening in, you know, um, you know, I just did an event and I hired uh, someone who is transitioning um, into, into the event world. Um, you know, so I was like, all right, just listen into the calls, um, you know, ask all your questions, you know, just I'm, I'm here as a resource, ask me anything if something doesn't make sense. But I also relied on her to to help me with things and ask her questions and ask her advice. You know, I don't I don't discount uh, just because she hasn't been doing this as long as I have. I don't discount her knowledge and her input. And I, I know you you feel the same way. Yeah, I think I want to highlight what you just said there of not being afraid to ask questions. And I think this is something that, again, no matter if you're just your first year in events or your 20th year, and maybe it just comes with time, you get more comfortable doing it, but you should always be okay answering, asking questions. And maybe it's just figuring out when that right time is. So um, such as something that's like, is this a question I should ask on a client facing call? Or like Jacqueline mentioned, write it down and answer and ask in my private one-on-one -on -one with the person I'm working with. Um but I couldn't agree with you more. I think my top way for learning is literally by doing. Um, and that helped me learn everything from what kind of events I enjoy more than others, what roles I enjoy more than others, what working style and kind of like value system I like working in versus others. Um, and that's just something I don't think I could have learned on paper somehow. Um, and it was just really actually getting into it. And we're a little biased on this podcast, I feel like, because we're you know, Mary and I are both kind of freelancers. We have our own businesses, but I, I would qualify us as freelancers. So we get to work with a lot of different people every year. And so that would be one of my pieces of advice for learning and how much I've enjoyed it is working with different people because you get to see the different styles and the reason, the things that aren't necessarily true for all events. There are certain things that it's like, no matter what event you do, there's going to be a BEO, but maybe the way you interpret it or organize it or you know, make your run a show is different. And it's fun to kind of, I enjoy getting to play around and be in different formats. So I can, that, and that's how I created my own style was from seeing, oh, I kind of like this. And I, oh, I kind of like that, but I don't like the way they did this. Okay. Let me, you know, create my own style. I didn't just come up with it out of nowhere. Um, so that's something that it was just helpful. And volunteering is a great way if you are working full-time for someone to see how other people function. Um, what do you think, Jacqueline? Do you, do you agree with that? <laughs> First, just in case you're new to events and you don't know what a BEO is, it's a banquet event order. And when you're working with, most of them are from hotels or large venues, and it lists everything from um, your AV to your food, timing, your servers, all of that, bars, all of that, um, that you sign off with, with the hotel. And sometimes if it's a small event and you're lucky, you have 30 pages. If it's a large event, you could have a thousand pages and then you have to check them they all. They can be so bad. Inevitably, there, there could, again, here's a learning experience, you know, yeah. read them all. I don't care how long they are. It will take you time. And if you have someone you could do it with even better, but go through every single page and make sure they're correct. Yes. And, and I also am lucky enough that I get to work with, um, you know, many different companies, uh, and many different uh, types of people and and kind of what you said, Logan, is learning as you go and be like, oh, I like how like this person did this. I'm going to add that into my regimen or I, I don't like how they did this. So I'm going to make a note to not do that in the future, um, you know, just to make yourself grow and be better uh, all the time. And 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 I also think what you said before about asking the questions is when I was younger, I wouldn't have been. I definitely didn't, not it would have been. I definitely didn't feel comfortable asking the questions like I do now. Um, it's taken me time to be comfortable uh, and not feel knowledgeable enough, even though it's kind of, I'm still asking questions to be more knowledgeable, but to be comfortable in where I am in my career to ask the questions. But I still definitely encourage 
someone new to the industry, again, like you said, you know, is this something I should ask in front of the client? If I'm not sure, wait for the one-on-one -on -one or send it like a Slack, if you're on Slack or an email, you know, just separately to the person you're working with going like, Hey, I had a question about this. You know, I didn't want to bring it up because I wasn't sure, but can like you either answer it here or let's discuss on our next touch base or whatever. Um, but definitely, definitely don't be afraid. I feel like always ask the questions and, and, you know, whatever, wherever you, as an event producer, I feel like it's my job to ask a million questions just to get to the root of what I'm trying to get done. But if you're like in the AV side, or if you're on the creative side, or if you're on the fabrication side or whatever genre, again, genre or section you're in within this world, definitely ask the questions because it is better. I'm very transparent when I work. I'm like, always will share information, you know, short of uh, going against any of the NDAs, but I, I, I like sharing information with, obviously with the clients, but with vendors so they know, and so they have a more 360 view. Um, and it just, it just helps uh, in the understanding of what we're trying to accomplish. That's yeah, definitely. Favorite. I think those are some great examples, Jacqueline, of how people can find the right time to ask the questions and just not be afraid of it. If you're in person, I think it's, yeah, reading it, like meal breaks are a great time if it seems like, again, don't barrage the person you work with with a million questions, but that's a great time. Or um, for me too, like learning also sometimes plays a role into what projects I say yes to. Um, I think it was when I was earlier in my event career, I was a little nervous about taking on things that were different or new. I think I kind of actually said yes to everything really maybe at that time, but I don't know if it was a part of my criteria, but I do definitely think about it now. Like when I say yes to projects, is it some reason? Cause I'm going to like learn something new. Is it because I'm learning about a new client or it's a new format or a new platform or just a new team that I'm working with. And that has been really helpful with informing for me about what just what projects are the right fit for me um, and getting events. And I'm like, I could do that event, but am I going to learn anything? Maybe not. But I have this other event that like, I'm definitely going to learn something. Okay. I'm going to pick, you know, event B for that reason. Um, and just being willing to kind of travel, you know, challenge yourself with those projects. Um, I often will think back on events that have been probably the most stressful before are the ones that I often learn the most from. And I have to remind that to myself every time I'm in a stressful pre-event period is like, okay, I'm learning. It doesn't mean it's going to feel good, <laughs> but I'm learning. Do you have any similar feelings, Jacqueline? Yeah. And, and you should always be learning. You know, I just did two, I just did a couple of events this this fall, all of them, I've come away learning something again from the 360 view, just not someone who's, you know, my exact peer, but, but from all around. And I have these, I don't know about you, but on site, I, at least once, so hopefully multiple times I have aha moments where I'm like, aha, here we go. This is it. Right. Or like, oh my gosh, yes, of course, you know, and again, not being afraid to acknowledge what you don't know. Um, but embracing, embracing it and, and, and talking to your team, um, again, from, again, I'm big in the 360, the 360 view, just not looking up or, or directly down, but all, all the way around, um, you know, and, 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 and have those aha moments where you come away going, all right, I, you know, this is what I learned, you know, not just the, the recap you're going to give the client, but also like for yourself, this is what I learned. Here's, here's what I want to do better. Here's what I can do better. Here's also what not to do, right? We've all been in the situation um, where we, we've had some bad learning experiences. Um, but, um, you know, you got to take it and, and go with it, good, bad, or otherwise, and work with it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, Jacqueline, you're, you're transitioning me to one of the things we teased at the top of the episode. Um, but I would love to talk examples of bad learning opportunities. And I'll go first with one, Jacqueline, when you think of one. But I, I mean, it's hard to say there really truly are bad ones. And so I think to get in my mind, when I think of a bad learning opportunity is maybe something where I paid a lot of money to attend a conference, to do a certification, to do some something. Um, and a lot of money is great. You know, it's all relative to you of what feels like a lot, whether that was $50 or $5,000. Um, but something where you paid a significant amount of money or a significant amount of time was put into it and you didn't come away with those takeaways. So just like going to a conference and feeling like oh, I didn't really get out what I wanted to get out of it. Um, I went to a conference earlier this year as an attendee, as a hosted buyer. Um, it was my first experience. It was fun to go do it. And it was fun to meet some of my other event pros in person. 
but I didn't necessarily feel valued as an event professional. It's a very weird feeling coming out of that experience. Um, and so just personally for me, it's not something that I would ever invest in financially. I don't know if I would also invest my time if I was just as busy as I was around then, but that would be to me like a bad learning experience. And again, they don't happen that often, which I'm fortunate for, but what about you, Jacqueline? What comes to mind when you hear of bad learning experiences or learning opportunities? Um, yeah, I, I've actually never gone to to a host environment, so that's interesting your perspective on it. Um, but I, I mean, bad learning opportunities, I think, could all, could be a conference or a course or something that you're taking, but also could be just when you're working with people and they don't value your opinion or listen to you and they just are like this is how it's going to be done and this is my way or the highway and i think in this in this world i mean this industry of course but in this world like that's no i mean yes there are times where it's like just yeah. do as i say please just just go get it done but i think um if you're brought on to do something specific right and the people around you aren't trusting you to do it, that's a bad, that's a bad experience. And that's a bad learning experience. Cause what are you actually going to learn other than to trust in the people that you're hiring and trust in your team? Yeah, I think, and, and the antidote to that, right, is making sure that you do get to work with different people um, or volunteer with other organizations or work with multiple clients, whatever that looks like, like Jacqueline's saying, so you can figure out if that's normal. I think for me, the most interesting part when I went from working full-time to freelance was realizing that like the systems we used weren't necessarily like a universal system that everybody uses. Like, you know, there's my, we, ha everybody has their own way of doing stuff and there's certain things that hold true and you need to have information on, but you can put your own spin on it, which makes it more fun for me. Um, might stress a couple people out as they get started, but I think realizing that there wasn't like one system I had to learn was really helpful. Um, but as we get towards the end of this week, this week's episode, I did want to let's end on some high notes. Um, so talking about some resources that we would recommend uh, for our listeners if they are interested in continuing to learn as event professionals. Jacqueline, do you have one that comes to mind first? I, sh I should have some. But uh, I mean, again, just like you said, Logan, like find find think of what you're interested in and what kind of where you want to be in the events world and see if you can volunteer with that type of event or, or, you know, find a, a producer or someone working the event and be like, what, what am I allowed to come volunteer and shadow you? Or even not necessarily on site, but like in pre-production, you know, even if you have to sign, you know, an NDA or whatever, you know, just, um, you know, it's like, it's like they say when you want a job, you know, stalk the people on LinkedIn and, you know, eventually you can reach out to them or whatever, but it's kind of the same thing. It's, you know, um, you know, re reach out to people and just ask the questions, ask if you can uh, come as a volunteer, um, you know, and, and it, it, it's like in anything, you kind of have to figure out where you want to be. You know, it took me, it took me a while as well when I first started out as to where my niche was. And what my niche is, I definitely knew it wasn't creative. I love the creatives because I, I am not the creative, but you give me the creative and I'll execute it for you. I'll get it printed. I'll make sure it's in the right place. I'll make sure it arrives on time. I'll make sure it's correct. It looks good. And I'll do all the logistics behind it. But just don't ask me to, to draw it or pick the colors. So, you know, f find your niche and find the people that you respect and, and reach out to them. There are... Um, Obviously, there's this podcast to listen to. There's there's books um, to listen to read. I like audiobooks these days because I live in LA and I sit in the car for a while, so audiobooks uh, are are a good journey for me. Um, but uh, you know, there there's a lot of organizations out there as well. Um, the ones that offer the CMPs and other such certifications definitely um, look into those. Um, and there are some schools like I know you kind of I know I'm babbling a little bit, but you mentioned the MBA. There are some schools out there that do have um, great events, MBA programs um, and or certificates if you're not going to get a full MBA, but they do offer certificates. Um, so just researching um, what those are. Yeah, I agree with I feel like everything you said, I'd love you to noodle if you have a specific book or audio book for our listeners. Um, but I would I think uh, to add to your list. 
we mentioned volunteering is so important. That's how like I volunteered at the Olympics. I then got to work at the Olympics. Were the gigs linked? No, but by going and volunteering, I it did it did lay a foundation for me anecdotally for getting that 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 next gig. Um, I would also encourage you just to attend events. If you are someone who you can't volunteer or, you know, you really like Jacqueline, you've done somewhat of Jacqueline saying, and you're not getting a response, you can also attend. My uh, poor partner, <laughs> I say poor, he, he, he loves it, but I feel bad for him sometimes because I drag him to a bunch of events and I always tell him, I'm like, it's research. Like we're here as attendees, but I'm also taking notes. Like Jacqueline said on my phone of what did I like as an attendee? What didn't I like? What was jarring or what was cool? What was really interesting? What am I telling everyone about afterwards? And this is, but this was really helpful for me because granted, I'm not doing the executing, so I can't really speak to that, but I can speak to the attendee experience and the things that stuck out to me and the things that I was like, why did no one think about this um, has been really helpful. And that was a way early on. And to this day, I still work into my event planning process and can work those into client calls and um, projects and things like that of just things I've observed. Um, and then also, yeah, just like noticing the people on headset, if that is something you want to do, if you want to be in production, like clock the people who are on headset or have a little walkie talkie in their ear. Or maybe if you're in the wedding industry, like at the next wedding of wedding you attend as a guest, like pay attention to what the catering's doing and all the vents, see if you can spot the vendors, where's the photographer, like some of that stuff that if you can't feel like you can get that foot in the door, or you're really, you know, hitting a wall there. That's a great experience. I use that when I was doing virtual events. And I was in that same position of I needed a virtual event experience to get the gig, but I need the gig to get the experience. Um, and I remember I went to the ESPN W's virtual broadcast and learned so like had my mind blown with all these key takeaways. And again, as an attendee, I was not behind the scenes helping pr like produce it. So just attending can help. Um, and then similar to Jacqueline, if love to know if you have a book, but for me, I love, and my event pro book club, we're reading this actually right now, the art of gathering by Priya Parker is really great for just having you think a little bit differently of like why we gather this more larger value system uh, versus just being like, I'm throwing a party or I'm throwing a conference. Why? Because we have to, <laughs> it just makes you think a little bit more crit critically. Um, and then I often sometimes pick up at like uh, thrift stores. I'll pick up like how to be an event planner. Sometimes I think I have a couple of them and I haven't read them yet because I've only parsed through, but Jacqueline, it reminded me of what you're saying that course experience was where I'm like, of course, you know this, but it's kind of funny to like read it to if anything validate to be like, oh, I do know what I'm talking about. So a hundred percent. And, and, and I, I do, I do like to like read those or, you know, um, you know, sometimes I'll be like reading a Bish Bash article or Skift or any, any of those and I'll, and you know, like 10 things from an event professional or something. And I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, like you said, validation, um, for sure. Uh, as far as I don't have a necessarily book, um, uh, that I can think of at the moment, but I think the, if I'm allowed to say, um, stop me if I'm not, I think that the school in Florida that I'm talking about is the university of Florida and they have, um, an MBA program for events, but they also have cool. a, a certification. If you, um, either don't have the time or cost prohibitive to do the full MBA, they have a really good certification program and they're very well known, um, within the industry. Um, University of so, Florida, you said. We'll put that in the show notes for listeners if I can find a link. I have one. I'll send to you. Um, but uh, but they and they're 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 very nice people. So um, that is a that is a good resource. Amazing. Well, listeners, I feel like we couldn't. You know, we could probably do an episode for an hour on this and fifteen hours talking about learning uh, because we value and love it so much. Um, but hopefully, you you feel like you've learned something with us about learning. Uh, Jacqueline, is there anything else that we've forgotten that we really want to include about? how you can keep learning as an event pro. I'll just reiterate to ask the questions. Don't be afraid. Um, it's okay to put yourself out there. Uh, just check on your timing, but you yes. got this. Don't ask all the questions when there's a huge, like proverbial fire going on. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And I wish luck to all, all the event professionals, new, old, and otherwise out there. Love it. Well, that brings us to the end of our episode. Uh, we always end with our bonus tip. And I figured, why not? We got Jacqueline here. Why don't we let Jacqueline do our bonus tip for the end of this episode? So Jacqueline, uh, what's our bonus tip? My bonus tip is um, Sharpies and pens. Always, always have Sharpies. And if you're at, because I, I do a lot of sporting events too. So if you're at a sporting event, make sure you get the silver Sharpies in addition to the black Sharpies, because the silver Sharpies are better for autographing um, sport, sports balls. Um, but always have a Sharpie, 
or multiple and um, a pen in your pocket and maybe a notebook that you carry around. I know that sounds old school um, because we have our phones and such, but sometimes it's just quicker to handwrite something. Um, You may disagree with me, but that's my quick little tidbit. And there's a a bonus pro tip. If you're a fan at a sporting event, always bring a Sharpie. You never know when you might need something autographed. Um, Well, thank you so much, Jacqueline. And thank you, listeners. This brings us to the end of our episode. You can follow us on Instagram at Better Events Pod. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Better Events Pod. Or send us an email, like Jacqueline mentioned, if you have questions or dying questions you've wanted to ask about events, but no one will answer them for you. Send us an email at bettereventspod at gmail.com. And as always, we appreciate you so much for listening and we'll be back in your feeds again next Wednesday. Thanks everybody.